<laughs> All right, good morning and welcome to our worship service at the New Burlington Church of Christ. Uh, the tones you're hearing are evidence of some kind of technical issue right now. Uh, we had our computer serviced and apparently uh, we haven't got all that worked out yet. So anyways, but uh, we, we may be singing without <laughs> the advantage of uh, seeing the lyrics, but uh, Elizabeth's going to lead us and uh, we'll still worship. We'll be familiar anyways, and maybe we won't need that too much. Uh, but uh, we are on uh, Facebook. We're on YouTube. Uh, I hope if you're on those platforms, you'll you'll look for us and like those videos and and uh, maybe even share those. But anyways, the more traction we get, the more people click on those, the more other people will find us. And, and that's the 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 real reason we're on there is, is to reach more people. And so uh, by your watching those, liking those, subscribing to the channel, and so on. That helps uh, increase our outreach and sharing spirit. I can't even talk today. Uh, sharing the gospel uh, uh, through this uh, gift of technology. So uh, if you're on those platforms, please uh, look for that and, and uh, help us out in that way. But uh, I think that's all I want to share right now. We'll, uh, there'll be some announcements a little bit later. But right now, Elizabeth is going to come and she's going to lead us in, uh, in worship today. Just a couple weeks before Christmas, uh, thinking about the, the coming of the Lord. Uh, and remember, he's not just the babe in the manger. He's the Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. And he's worthy of our worship today. Let's stand and worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. And so we will begin with Angels We Have Heard On High. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus, the one who was born, of whom the angels sang, whom the, whom the shepherds came to, to adore and, and to admire, to worship, the one that brought wise men hundreds of miles from the east to come and to, to worship, and the one whom we've come to worship this morning. May we worship in spirit and in truth. May we keep the true spirit of Christ in our hearts, not just at one special time of the year, but all through the year and all through our lives. And may others see the Christ in us, the one who has come to be Emmanuel, God with us. We give you thanks and praise and ask your blessing this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, there are several upcoming events uh, listed in your bulletin. Uh, I'll make note of the, the top one here. Next Sunday, December 19th, uh, we'll be taking a special Christmas offering uh, to support Impact Christian Church. Uh, I, I meant to uh, pause and show a video last week. Uh, I had sent it, and, and everything was ready except me, apparently. <laughs> Uh, we don't have that available today. We'll, we'll show that next week to show you the work that's going on there in the Columbus area on the east side. But uh, exciting work going on, uh, Impact Christian Church. So our offering, our special Christmas offering, uh, we'll be taking at the end of the service. We'll take our regular offering at the normal time. But then at the end of the service, we'll take a special offering for Impact Christian Church. Uh, and then that evening, we're going caroling. So come back and join us. Uh, I can't promise you, but I don't think it'll be as cold as it was yesterday. So, <laughs> uh, whoo, that was bitter, wasn't it? But uh, anyways, come back uh, next Sunday evening, 6 o'clock. We're going to do some caroling and uh, visit some folks and just share the Christmas joy with them. Um, and then the first Sunday of the year, January 2nd, we're calling that Come Back to Church Sunday. If you're watching our services online on, on YouTube or on Facebook, and uh oh do we have the video ready you got it bill you're the man all right bill let's see this uh video from impact christian church We planted in a suburb of Columbus called Impact Church Roansburg as part of the Christian churches and Church of Christ. So we really wanted to start a church that would be multi-ethnic, super involved in the community, and our most important goal was a church, church that would reach lost people, people that are unchurched and de church. And the exciting thing is we are actually doing it. We are seeing so many people coming to Impact that have told us, they haven't been to church in years, or they never even grew up in church. And to see that be a reality is super exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and library research backs that up, that one of the most effective ways to reach unchurched people is to start plant new churches. 42% uh, of people who attend new church plants previously had not been going to church anywhere. So we're really excited to show you this next part, which is a lady named Joyce, who started coming to our church and uh, showing that we have become multi-ethnic. And you're just going to love her story. <laughs> it's really, really cool about the kids that she started bringing to church. I want to tell you about a church, Impact. That impact my life. I have five nephew and one great niece. And they always want to come with me. I've been writing the church there. Now they ask me every night, just like, is tomorrow we go to church? Is tomorrow Sunday? And I'll tell them, no, tomorrow not Sunday. But when is Sunday? I'm going to stay up so I can get up early. Don't you leave me. I'm not going to leave you. I'll let you know. It really brought me out. By going there. And I've been going a couple of months. And it brought me out. I feel so refreshing going there. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. And we would be honored if you would share this video with your missions committee or your elders or whoever it is that makes decisions about where you uh, give towards missions. Um, we would like to be in that consideration. So why are we sending you this video? We would love to see 10 churches partner with us monthly in support and through prayer to see more and more impact happen in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. Yep, so please share this video. And we do have a longer video that goes more into depth about our ministry and, and, and what's going on, why we started it, and what we're seeing happen. Um, but please share this video and then reply to this email 
uh, or call my number, my personal cell that's in the email, and let's get a conversation going about how you can help support and reach the unchurched in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. Thanks. Thanks. All right, yeah, that was an email that came to me, and so I just shared it with you like they asked me to. <laughs> so uh, we're not to the point of email take on as you know a, a regular admission, but we uh, did decide that we would take a special offering, uh, kind of a one-time gift to help them. And if any of you feel led to support the, the work in an ongoing way, certainly that's up to you. Uh, you're welcome to do that. If you want more information, I'll be happy to try to get that for you. So uh, that's Impact Christian Church on the east side of Columbus. We'll uh, bedroom community called Reynoldsburg. Uh, so uh, that's where our special offering is going to go this year. Um, all right. I think that's all the announcements I need to share. Uh, Elizabeth's going to come back up. Uh, I will mention, you know, the uh, Bible reading plan has finished. I'm working on the new one. I'll have that for you next week. Uh, so we, next year, again, we can read through and Bill will keep those in the bulletin, but we'll have a little book available if you want that. Um, it's been a little busy, so I've got the plan worked together. I just don't have anything printed up yet. So uh, we'll have that next week so we can begin uh, first of the year uh, reading through the Bible or reading through the New Testament as you please uh, for next year again, like we've done the last couple of years. All right, Elizabeth, lead us in worship, please. Okay, well, you would please stand and join me. I'm hoping I've done this one enough that you all recognize it. Garland of Praise. And just want to encourage you to worship as the Lord leads and spirit in the truth. If you feel like clapping, clap. If you feel like dancing, dance. If you feel like running, run. We don't run out of the building. <laughs> Stay with us. Worship the Lord as you feel like. What well, another the Lord for the spirit of happiness. Lift up your voice to God.
Men are going to pass out the uh, communion emblems right now. Go ahead, men, and uh, just take those and hold them. You'll you'll take a stack. You know, remember what we're doing. Uh, the bottom has the bread, the top has the uh, the juice. Just take those and hold those, and Brother Tim will lead us in a meditation in a little bit, and then uh, we'll partake in unison. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, for our community time this morning, I would uh, like to say that we are uh, a group of people who, when we don't feel we got what we deserve, we are very quick to announce it and want to be compensated for what we feel belongs to us. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful God doesn't work that way. Because if he did, there'd be no need for us to be here today. And as part of that, I would like to read from Psalm 103, verses 10 to 12. And it reads as follows. He hath not dealt with us after our sin, not, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. In doing so, in approving that, he showed compassion and mercy upon us, which we didn't deserve. So much so that he sent his own one and only son to die on the cross for our sins, that which we did not deserve. At this time, would you please take the bread, which represents his body that was broken and bruised for our iniquities. Now, would you please take the cup and drink it, knowing that this cup represents his blood that was shed for remission of our sins. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are just in awe that you have such great compassion and mercy upon us. Lord, I pray this morning that you would use us, work through us, Lord, to show that compassion and mercy to others in our lives and let them know that there is hope for those who fear you and love you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. As we come to our time of offering, I'd like to read a, uh, a quotation and I'd like for you to give it some thought this morning. And it reads as follows. A kind gesture can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. You have two hands. One is to help yourself, the second one to help others. When you learn, teach. When you get, give. Only by giving are you able to receive more than you already have. It's not how much we give, but how much love we put into the giving. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for lessons. Thank you for our health. Thank you for allowing us to be your soldiers, to go out into this world and to give and show compassion and mercy and to help others in need. Lord, there are many needs as we just recently seen through this tornadic day, how it has devastated many lives and caused many people to wonder what is next. Lord, I pray that you would send your people in, lend a, lend a kind hand and a kind word and this time in their lives to show them that there is hope. Lord, use us to get the message out. Bless the gift and the giver this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One thing I wanted to add during announcements, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, yesterday, we had a little cleanup day. I wasn't able to be here, of course, but uh, had a good crew. And special thanks go to Sandy and Charles and Godfrey. I'm told they just uh, really uh, stepped up and, and worked hard and, and did a great job. And uh, so we want to give a special thanks to, to those three who, who really went above and beyond 
uh, help get our building in, in good shape as we welcome visitors during the holiday season. We know it's just, it's not even two weeks now till Christmas. And the gifts will be exchanged and given. Uh, are you going to be celebrating with children? Isn't that fun? That That's that's a fun part of Christmas, celebrating with children, watching the excitement, you know, as the little ones rip into their packages and and, and see what they got. And, and, you know, they don't even notice, you know, as mom and dad quietly exchange their gifts, you know, they're just so excited about the the uh, the gifts and so on. But even before Christmas, you know, there, there are gifts exchanged, maybe at work. Uh, do, you, do you do that? Do you draw names or something at work or, or or do you play that game where everyone just brings in a gift, you know, and they get a number and you draw a number and then if... Uh, if you draw one and you like what someone else already got, you know, you steal theirs, you know, you just play that game. You know. Gifts are always part of Christmas. You know, as, as we grow older, they don't become the main part, you know, getting together with family. I remember we used to go to, to both my grandmother's houses. They, they only live 20 minutes apart. So we'd go to Grandma Dillon's and then to Grandma Underwood's or the other way around, you know, and uh, just a, a lot of fun being with family. And, and uh, as I get older, that that's that's more important to me than than any gifts that uh, any of our, our our kids or whoever uh, gives to me. But being with family, but still gifts are always part of Christmas. And in our text today, we're going to see some precious gifts given. The wise men or the magi, as they're sometimes called in some translations, presented gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh to the Christ child. But those aren't the gifts I want to talk about today. You know, we began a, a little series a couple of weeks ago in which uh, we're looking at the gifts that God gives to us at Christmas, or more specifically, in the person of Christ, who's coming. We celebrate at Christmas. You know, we, we interrupted the series last week to welcome our brother Rick Cherick back to, to bring a message, and it was so good to see Rick and hear him, and uh, what a great message he had, didn't he? But uh, anyways, we're back now. We're back into our series, and, and we're... we're we're looking at familiar Christmas narratives from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and we're finding a treasure trove of gifts that only God can give. Gifts that he gives us in the person of Jesus. So let's follow the wise men to Bethlehem this morning and discover the gifts that God has for us today. Let me read the text. It's Matthew, the second chapter, the first 12 verses. Matthew writes, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of, it, of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then, then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Well, after hearing the king, they went on their way. And the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the Christ child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Well, before we get too far in the message, I suppose we need to take a moment and try to identify the Magi. It's hard to do because they're not identified in Scripture except to note that they were Magi. Interestingly, this is the only positive use of that word in the New Testament. It appears elsewhere in the singular, magus, but not in a, in a good way. Magus is typically translated sorcerer or magician. There are two other magi in the New Testament. Simon is the first one in Acts chapter 8, and a man named Elymas in Acts 13. And both of them are bad guys. 
Simon had used his magic to impress the people of Samaria. And the implication is that he was either a fraud or he used some kind of demonic power to do the things that he did. He's the one who tried to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit. When we saw Peter and John imparting the power of the Spirit by laying on his, he tried to buy that power from them. You've probably heard the term simony. It's the practice of, of selling political or workplace favors for money or for illegal contributions. It's called simony because of this guy named Simon. <laughs> That's where that term comes from. And Simon was rebuked by Peter with one of the most scathing rebukes we'll find in the entire book of Acts. And then there's Elymas, also called Bar-Jesus. He was a sorcerer that Paul and Barnabas met on the island of Cyprus. He seems to have had some position of influence with the proconsul there. And when the proconsul wanted to hear the gospel that Paul and Barnabas were preaching, Elymas tried to interfere to prevent the proconsul from coming to faith in Jesus. Well, Paul tops Peter's rebuke of Simon when he rebukes Elymas. So magi or wise men in the New Testament are generally not good guys. But, he, but there are other wise men in the Bible. In the Old Testament, wise men and magicians. We find them first in, in Egypt. In Genesis 41, Pharaoh has a bad dream. And he calls all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Genesis 41, 8 tells us that. He calls the magicians, the wise men, to interpret his dream. Now, the way it's worded there sounds like magicians and wise men might be two different groups. But it's probably repetition for emphasis. It's, it's the same people, the wise men, the magicians. These are men who supposedly can divine what the, the gods, and, and in Egypt they had lots of gods, uh, they could divine what the gods were communicating, and that's why they were advisors to the Pharaoh. Many countries had so-called wise men who, who supposedly could interpret what the gods were saying as advisors to the king. So they come, but they're unable to interpret these dreams. This is when Joseph, you know, the number 11 son of Jacob, who's, who, who got sold by his brothers, and he's in Egypt because of that, this is how he comes to prominence. He becomes second in command to Pharaoh because he's able to interpret the dream. And he too is seen as a wise man since he interprets the dream. He's given the daughter of a priest as his bride. We next see the magicians of Egypt in the book of Exodus. And again, they oppose the work of God. At first, duplicating Moses' signs by their magic arts. But at some point, they can no longer imitate God's signs, and they urge the Pharaoh to yield. They say the God of the Hebrews is greater. They, they realize he's greater than their sorcery. Pharaoh should have listened to him. We know how that story ended up. The more to the point of identifying the, the magi or the wise men in Matthew are the Babylonian and Persian wise men of the exilic era of Israelite history. You know, when Babylon conquered Judah, it, it happened in stages. When, when they finally destroyed the city and deported the people, that was actually the third deportation of some of the Jewish people. And the prophet Daniel was taken early. He was in the first deportation. And once in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar wanted him and his friends to join the ranks of his wise men. Daniel 1, 19 to 21 says, they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, the king. Well, Cyrus is the Persian king that conquered Babylon and allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem. So Daniel has influence over the leaders of the realm the entire time of the captivity. And it's Daniel's influence on the ranks of the wise men of the East that many scholars point to in order to explain the actions of the Magi here in Matthew. No doubt they still worship pagan gods. They still use some kind of pagan means of divination. And yet they've been influenced by the Jewish people and by their scriptures. They recognize the God of the Hebrews is greater than their gods. They apparently don't yet recognize that their gods are no gods at all. But 
at least they recognize Jehovah or Yahweh as supreme. And in fact, the Magi who make this trip to Bethlehem, they may even recognize God as the only true God. We notice in verse 12 that, that God communicates directly with them. That seems to set them apart from the ordinary wise men of the East. So with, with that rather brief and probably unsatisfactory explanation of who the Magi were, let's see what we can learn from the account of their mission. Let's see what Christmas gifts God has for us today. And first of all, we see that Jesus gives us the gift of hope. The gift of hope. <clears throat> However, the Magi knew what they knew. It stirred in them a sense of hope. You know, behaviorists will tell us that, that, that we do things because we've been programmed by our past to do things. And, and, and that might be how you, you train animals. But, but I don't believe that's how people work. Tony Campolo agrees with me. He made the point this way. He said his son had spent all summer one year shooting a basketball at the hoop in their driveway. Why did he do that, Tony asked. Was it because he was somehow programmed to do so by his past? No. It was because he had hope. He hoped to make the basketball team at school in the fall. And so we spent all summer looking ahead, looking in hope. His hope was what drove him, not his past. And in the same way, those wise men were not programmed by their past to set out on a journey of hundreds of miles. They were driven by hope. This new king was unique. This new king would change things. This new king was not just for the Jews, but for them too. The wise men had a hope that went beyond political aspirations. And while they asked about a king, they asked, where is the king of the Jews? They were looking for someone they could worship. Look at verse two. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Not to pay tribute to a great political leader, to worship. The wise men were looking for someone greater than a political ruler, someone greater than a, a king, someone who had come for more than just the Jews. They called him king of the Jews, but somehow they knew that they, Gentiles, would be welcome. And so they went to worship. My friend Keith Dimbath explains this so beautifully on a Facebook post a few years back. Keith uh, had lost his mother in 2015, and, and his wife, Christy, lost her father the very next year, just before Christmas. And as Keith was preparing for, for speaking at that funeral back in 2016, he shared some of his thoughts on, on Facebook. He mentioned that he still missed his mother, especially at Christmas, as she really loved this time of year. And then losing Christie's dad in some tragic manner just two weeks before Christmas, he said, was a difficult thing to process. Yet he and Christie were comforted knowing that their parents were believers in Jesus. They were Christians. I know exactly what he was talking about. At my own dad's funeral yesterday, we were able to celebrate a life lived with faith and with hope. But listen to what Keith said next. I'm reminded of Paul's thoughts in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. This is what Christy and I believe, he says, and we pray that you do too. Hope is found in Christ. This is why we celebrate Christmas. As the Christmas carol says, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Jesus gives the gift of hope. Open that gift today. Jesus came not just for Jews, not just for wise men from the East, he came for you. He came to give you hope. And then secondly, Jesus gives us the gift of significance. Look at verse six. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You see, Bethlehem was a, an unspectacular town in that day. Nobody thought much of it. It was just five miles south of Jerusalem, so we might think of it as a, a bedroom community to the capital. But remember, with, with no interstates, with no cars or buses, you know, five miles is a pretty good trek. Good hour or more to make that journey. And even though it was the birthplace of the great King David, that didn't seem to make much difference back then. You know, not like today, you know, when such a fact would, would make it a tourist location. After all, who had ever heard of Hope, Arkansas? Until we found out it was the birthplace of a former president, Bill Clinton. And yet it was Bethlehem that God chose to be the birthplace of the Messiah, his only begotten son. Now today, Bethlehem is a tourist location. You know, people want to travel there to see the place where Jesus was born, even though there's really no way of knowing exactly where that event happened in Bethlehem. But that's not the point. See, Bethlehem is significant, not just as the birthplace of a famous person, the way Hope, Arkansas is famous. Bethlehem is significant because it played a role in redemption history. The prophet named Bethlehem as the place where this would happen. And it was indeed the place. You see, Bethlehem proves Jesus is who he claims to be. Hope, Arkansas became significant in, in a certain way after the fact. After Clinton became president. Bethlehem became significant immediately. When the Christ child was born, the fact that he was born in Bethlehem proved he was the newborn king. It was significant immediately because it proved scripture's true. It proved his identity. But even more significant than Bethlehem is you. Christ gives you significance. You've heard the expression, Jesus is the reason for the season. Well, actually, you are the reason for the season. We are the reason. Jesus would never have come if we had not needed a Savior. He came for us. We need to claim the significance that Jesus gives us. As another carol says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Christ in us gives us significance. You know, we all have significance simply because we're made in God's image. That's significant. That's meaningful. But of course, we know that sin mars that image. Sin damages us. Sin makes us spoiled. Yet even in our damaged condition, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For us. And having died for us, he now lives in us to make us pure and holy. The image of God inherent and yet damaged in all people is recreated in Christ. So that, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. You are important to God. To God. You're significant. Christmas proves it. And then there's one more gift we need to open today. And that's the gift of awe. Jesus gives us the gift of awe. We overuse the word awesome today. Ball games are awesome. Wedding gowns are awesome. TV shows are awesome. Hairstyles are awesome. Fruitcakes are awesome. Well, I don't suppose anyone ever said a fruitcake was awesome. 
But you get my point. If everything is awesome, nothing's awesome. Awesome means filled with awe. And awe is that sound that leaks out when your jaw drops. Ah. So awesome is properly reserved for those things that truly make your jaw drop. The wise men experienced it. Upon leaving Herod, the star appeared. Verse 10 says, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That is awe. The song speaks of their following the star, westward leading, still proceeding, but that's not what the Bible says. The wise men told Sarah that they had seen the star in the east. They didn't say they'd been following it. If they had been following the star, they wouldn't have stopped in Jerusalem. They would have kept on going, following the star. Apparently, it appeared in the east, and then they knew what it meant, and so they started out. And they hadn't seen it for some time. But now the star is back. After possibly two years, the star has returned. That was truly awesome. Can't you just see them staring mouths agape at that bright star that, that they had seen before, but now it's back? That is all. And upon arriving at the house where Jesus was, they fell to the ground, verse 11 says, and worshiped him. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, that's all. That was the attitude of their worship. And today we can be way too casual about worship. Worship should capture something of the awe that Jesus inspires in us. Now, I'm not saying we should all fall prostrate on the floor. But we ought to recognize that we're in the presence of the Holy One, of the awesome God, creator, ruler, redeemer. For some, worship is a show. It's a show. The, 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 the actors, you know, are, are, are the people up front and, and, and the rest are the audience, you know, here to be entertained and, you know, to see the show. And, and afterwards, they'll critique those actors. You know, the music wasn't the kind I liked. The preacher went too long. Such people may be heard to say, I didn't get much out of worship today. But worship is not about getting something. Worship is about giving. Giving of ourselves. Of ourselves. The wise men gave generous gifts. They gave gold frankincense, and myrrh. And no doubt these became the resources that in God's providence made it possible for the family to go to Egypt. We know after the, the wise men left, Herod looked uh, for the Christ child to kill him and so they fled to Egypt and were there some time. Where did a poor family get the resources for that? Probably from the gifts the wise men gave them. Well, we also receive an offering when we gather for worship. And in God's providence, our gifts provide for God's work to be done and for people to be blessed. But the offering is merely a symbol. In worship, we give ourselves. We sing as an offering of praise. We approach the throne of grace, God's holy presence in our prayers. We travel to the cross of Jesus as we take the Lord's Supper. Everything about our worship should remind us of the awesome nature of our God. In fact, I generally try to reserve the word awesome for things that relate to God. God is awesome. And in a sense, only God is awesome. So experience the awe that Christ brings. Open the gift of awe today. Worship the Lord in his holiness. Hope, significance, and awe. Whatever you unwrap by the Christmas tree this year, you won't find gifts so precious as these.
Have you received these gifts from Jesus? Do you live in hope? Are you confident that your life has significance? That you, you are important? Do you know the awe of Christ's presence? I hope you do. These are among the most precious gifts that Jesus wants us to have. But if you don't have those, if you don't know those today, why not receive them? Elizabeth, come back up here. We're going to sing a, a song of, of invitation. This is a, an invitation to you to accept these gifts, the gifts that Jesus has, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, the gift of being recreated in the image of him. Confess your faith in Christ Jesus today. Be buried with him in baptism and rise to walk in that newness of life. What better way to celebrate Christmas than by receiving these precious gifts? If you're not in him today, if you're not a Christian, if you've never been buried with him in baptism to begin that new life, won't you come? Won't you come as we stand and as we sing? Next week, we're uh, taking our special offering. I hope you'll prepare for that and, and, and give generously to support this new work. Uh, I got a bonus at church, and so we're going to tie that and uh, a little more than that. But uh, we want to support that work. Going, I hope, hope you'll support that, too. It's, it's one of the gifts you give this Christmas to give to the, the people in Reynoldsburg. Uh, the opportunity to know a church that, that is reaching people of all colors and backgrounds and 
it's just a great work going on there. And also next Sunday night, we're going Carolyn. Hope you'll join us and, uh, and, and take part in that. Remember the uh, fire fund out in the foyer. If uh, you'd be so kind as to share in that, uh, we'd sure appreciate that as well. Uh, Christmas Eve, we have a service. Uh, I'm still looking for a couple of readers. If, if you want to help out with that, uh, let me know. And I'd be glad to have you take part in our, in our service. Christmas Eve uh, at 6 o'clock. Any other announcements that we need to take care of? All right. Let's close them with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus. We thank you for the gifts that are ours in him. The gift of significance to know that, that we matter to you. The gift of, of, of awe to, to worship. Not in fear, but in love. Know that you've loved us with an everlasting love gift of hope, looking forward to that day when you return. Lord, help us to own these gifts and to, to give them away, to share them with others. Thank you for the gift of Jesus and all that means to us. Bless us as we go forth now in his name, as his disciples, as his ambassadors to a world that needs to know a Savior has come. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's our Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. God bless. Thank you.